Please, congregation, turn your Bibles this morning to 2 Kings chapter 4. If you're using our Adoration Bible, 2 Kings 4 can be found on page 392. 392 in the Adoration Bibles. Picking up where we left off last time, we'll begin our reading at verse 8, and we'll read through the end of verse 37. You'll recall from last time, from verses 1 through 7, that we were met with a, a poor widow, her husband had died, and now the creditor was going to take her two sons away. But this morning, we're met with a wealthy wife. And as such, we're reminded that God is is not a respecter of persons. He intervenes in the lives of those who have little as well as those who have a lot. And He shows them His grace. Well, beginning at verse 8, listen to what the Word of the Lord says. One day, Elisha went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, to urge him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this man is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. And one day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoke on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, At this season, about, next t- about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, a man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Now, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap until noon. And then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys, that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, All is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Now, when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, All is well. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me. He has not told me. And she said, did I not, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore he returned to meet him and told him, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up on the child, and putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. 
Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Well, dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, where do you go when troubles and trials come your way? What do you do? How do you respond when, when tragedy strikes? These are important questions to ask yourself because even if you're not going through a trial today, you might find yourself in one tomorrow. Trials and tribulations are sure to come your way. Jesus said that to his disciples. In this world, you will have trouble. There's no getting around it. Life in this world is not always easy. Life in this world is often a a mixed bag. It's a reality that we're confronted with all the time, isn't it? You you need only read through the prayer requests in our bulletin to see that, that this is so. For our sister Hannah, the, the joy of a new baby is, is mingled with the frustration of, of slow recovery. On the, on the one hand, we, we rejoice with, with the sycamores and that Audrey is now recovering at home when just over a week ago the word widowmaker was being thrown around. But on the other hand, we grieve and, and we mourn with, with the Wassenaars and the, and the loss of a father and grandfather and with our brother Frank and the loss of a sister. Life in this world is a mixed bag. Sometimes we find ourselves in seasons of, of great gladness and everything seems to be going great when everything is, is going according to plan and then we, we turn the corner and we find ourselves in a season of sadness when life seems to be falling apart. And the trouble or, or the difficulty in this is that both seasons, seasons of gladness and seasons of sadness, both seasons we know as Christians come from the hand of the Lord. That's what we confess in Lord's Days 9 and 10 of our catechism, that we believe that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has become our God and Father for the sake of Christ His Son. We trust Him so much that we do not doubt that He will turn to our good whatever adversity He sends our way in this sad world. As we go on to confess in Lord's Day 10, we believe that God upholds the universe and He rules all things so that rain and drought, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. God is the one who brings us into seasons of gladness, and God is the one who brings us through seasons of sadness. And the question that we're confronted with this morning is whether or not we can say, all is well, regardless of what season we find ourselves living in. It's easy to say, it's easy to sing, it is well, when, when peace like a river attendeth my way. But what about when sorrows like sea billows roll? What about then? What about when Satan buffets, when, when trials come? Does this blessed assurance control that, that Christ has regarded your helpless estate so that you can say, it is well with my soul? Perhaps you notice how that phrase was used five times in our Scripture reading. In verse 23, the woman tells her husband, all is well. Elisha's servant asks her, is all well? Is all well? And she says, all is well. And the word that's used there in the original language is the word shalom, which you may know is a word that connotes peace and and wholeness. Shalom is a word that evokes the imagery of, of new creation. All things are well. Lion laying down with the lamb. And when this woman says to her husband, when she says to Elisha's servant, all is well, She's not lying. 
She's not doing what we often do. She's not saying, I'm fine, when really she's not fine. But when this woman says, all is well, she is confessing her faith. As she rushes out to God's word bearer, she does so with, with the truth of Lord's Days 9 and 10 written on her heart. And, and from her heart, her mouth speaks, all is well. In the midst of her distress, what does she do? She, she clings to the Lord's prophet. She, she says, as the Lord of hosts lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. She falls at his feet and will not let him go. And as she clings to him, as she clings to the prophet of the Lord, she is in some measure clinging to the Lord himself. And so as she does this, the Spirit is teaching us that we also are, are to do when, when trials come, when tragedy strikes and faith, we too must, must run to God's word bear. We too must, must cling to him and say, I, w- I will not leave you. Come what may, I, I will not leave you. When we find ourselves in seasons of sadness, the Lord Jesus says, come to me. Come to me and, and cling to me, and, and I will give you rest. We note that our passage doesn't begin with sadness. Our passage <clears throat> begins with gladness. Our passage begins with a woman who seems to have it all. In contrast to the poor widow from verses 1 through 7, this woman is well off. She's a woman of means. Not only is she able to feed the prophet, she's also able to, to house the prophet. She has servants and, and livestock. She knows a measure of security. She says in verse 13, I, I dwell among my own people. I'm, I'm doing all right. I don't stand in need of anything. And despite the fact this woman was never given a child, it would seem as though she had learned the secret of contentment. There doesn't appear to be any bitterness in her heart towards God. Rather, this woman has found other avenues to, to serve God. She's been given the opportunity to ensure that the prophet Elisha always has a a place to stay when he passes through Shunem. And she's taken hold of that opportunity. And so in the opening verse of our passage, we see a beautiful expression of this woman's faith. At a time when the vast majority of Israel rejected the Lord and, and despised the prophets of the Lord, this woman welcomes the prophet of the Lord. She must have had the truth of Matthew chapter 10 written on her heart that whoever receives the Lord's messenger receives the Lord himself. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will surely receive a prophet's reward. The passage begins with a beautiful expression of this woman's faith. Here is a a Hebrews 13 woman. Hebrews 13 verses 1 and 2 says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Here's a woman who knows the truth of of 2 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, Let let each one must give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a a cheerful giver. Here's a a Proverbs 3, verse 9 woman who is seeking to, to honor the Lord with her wealth. And Elisha's desire in verses 11 and following, is to honor her in return. But, but what do you do for the woman who seems to have everything? Well, Elisha's servant has an idea in verse 14. He says she has no son, and her husband is old. This, of course, is something that we're met with throughout the Bible, isn't it? This theme of, of barrenness. Sarah, we know, found herself in a similar situation in Genesis 21. She had no child, and her husband Abraham was old. But the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised, and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son, and they called his name Isaac. Likewise, it wasn't until Isaac and Rebekah had been married for 20 years that Jacob and Esau came along, and then Jacob's wife Rachel found herself in the same situation until the Lord finally gave her Joseph. And so it was with the mothers of Samson and Samuel in the days of the judges. We see it again in the New Testament as well with Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly before God. 
But Luke says they had no child, for Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. And this biblical motif of barrenness that runs throughout the Bible is, of course, pressing home something of the reality of our own spiritual barrenness and how God alone is able to to overcome that spiritual barrenness in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see a glimpse of that here in 2 Kings chapter 4. And in typical biblical style, Elisha says to her, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. At first, the woman woman protested, saying, No, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. It was likely something that she and her husband had prayed for for years, but now it would seem the prospect of a child has been put to rest in her mind. And so she doesn't want her hopes to get up lest they be dashed to pieces. But in biblical, typical, biblical style, what do we read in verse 17? The woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, just as Elisha said to her. And yet there's something that's very unique, that's something, there's something that's rather untypical about this birth, because in almost every other instance in the Bible, we're met with a, a barren woman who is given a child. It's because the Lord has some greater purpose in view. You'll recall that when it came to the births of, of Isaac and Jacob, it was because the Lord needed the line of promise to continue. When the Lord answered Rachel's prayers and gave him Joseph, it was because God had great plans for Joseph in Egypt. And so it was with the mothers of, of Samson and Samuel. God was going to, to raise them up to be judges over Israel. So it was with Zechariah and Elizabeth. John the Baptist was going to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus. But none of this applies to the situation described here. This woman and this child both remain anonymous. This boy doesn't grow up to be some prominent leader or prominent figure in Israel's history. More than likely, he took over the the family farm. So what's the point? Why, Why this particular intervention in this particular woman's life? I think the point is this. I think the point is that sometimes the Lord blesses His people simply because He loves them and because He wants to. Who among us is extraordinary in this world? Most of us will remain largely anonymous in the annals of history, but our God is good. He's the overflowing fountain of all good, and He is a God who often blesses us just to bless us. Not because we're so prominent or so useful or so outstanding, but because that's just who He is. He gives a home to barren ones and blesses them with holy sons. He gives the joy of motherhood. Sing hallelujah, God is good. Only the false gospel of the serpent, writes one pastor, makes God out to be stingy and manipulative. Just count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings and see what God has done. The Lord blessed this woman with a son. The boy grows up and we find him helping his father out in the field. But then what happens Tragedy strikes. Tragedy strikes the the Shunammite home. One morning, as he was out in the field, he came to his father, oh, my head, my head, and the father sends the boy to his mother, and he sits on her lap, and then he dies. You can just imagine the grief of the mother the Lord had given, and now he's taken away, and and she doesn't understand why. Why has the Lord done this? If, if the Lord was going to give her a child only to take him away, then why did He give him at all? And this is the difficulty we're confronted with. This is the, the rub of our passage. The God who gave her a son and the God who took her son away is one and the same. The woman's faith is being tested by tragedy. How Will she respond? How do we respond? What are we to make of this? Is is God being cruel? 
Has God given her a son only to increase her pain? Does God lift us up so that it'll hurt more when we fall? What's this woman to make of this? What is she to do? Similar to the widow from verses 1 through 7, this woman also looks to the prophet of the Lord. She places her son on his bed, and she sets out to find Elisha, and she, she heads to the right place, and as she does so, she confesses all is well. And when she finally reaches Elisha, she takes hold of his feet, and she refuses to let go, and as she clings to Elisha, as I said, she is in some measure clinging to the Lord himself. For although Elisha himself is not the Lord, he is the Lord's representative. And as such, Elisha, we know, is, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a picture of Christ, Elisha is the woman's access point to true hope, to true help. There is no one else to turn to, she sees, other than to the Lord himself. In the midst of her confusion and, and perplexity, and all those questions, why has this happened? She has no other recourse than to turn to the very one who sent these things her way. And this congregation is, is what faith does. Faith clings to God even when we don't understand what's going on. Faith clings to the Lord and refuses to let go. That's what the Apostle Peter is getting at in the opening lines of his first letter as he writes to these suffering believers, as they no doubt were wondering, why are we suffering as we are? Why are we going through all these trials and tribulations? The emperor is killing off Christians every day. He's, he's burning them as torches in his gardens. Why is this happening? And what does Peter say to them? He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtain the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." We sang of that very same thing. God says, when through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless. I will sanctify to you your deep distress. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume your gold to refine. In chapter 5 of the same letter, we learn that the trials of this life serve to bring us closer to the Lord. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your cares upon Him, knowing that He cares for you. When trials come, when tragedy strikes, our only recourse is to cling to the one who sent them. That's our only option. He's the only one who can offer true help and true hope. In verse 27, we read that Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Elisha, we discover, is a man of limited knowledge. Elisha is not God. Elisha doesn't know why this has happened. He doesn't even know what's happened. The woman has to spell it out for him. Elisha has been granted to know the secret things of God because Elisha is not God. But the Lord Jesus is, and isn't it amazing that the Lord Jesus gives us the means of prayer, not so much for His own sake, but for our sake? That even though He already knows everything that's going on in your life, He understands it fully. He's a, a sympathetic Savior. He, he knows what you're going through. 
He bids you to cast your cares upon him anyways. As the Westminster Catechism says, in addition to giving us the word and the sacraments, Christ has also given us prayer as a means of grace through which we come to know him more fully as our mediator and friend. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer, we sing. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. So take it to the Lord in prayer. Elisha is a man of Limited knowledge. He doesn't know why this tragedy has struck the Shunammite home. And, and sometimes that's all we can say, too. Sometimes all we can say is, I don't know. I don't know why God has allowed this to happen. We don't have all the answers. The secret things belong to the Lord. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children. And, and what God has revealed is that although His ways are not always understandable, His ways are always good. And when tragedy strikes, when darkness comes, the Bible calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. I recently came across the writings of a woman who describes her own experience with childlessness. She says, nothing in my life has been as baffling to me as not being able to conceive a child. My emotions hide even from myself, spilling out in tears at times of sadness or anger at the most inopportune times. There have been no days of real clarity, no time when a light has come to show the way, not even a little. But the mysterious and marvelous mystery of God has convinced me of one thing in all this, Life is not dark because God is against me, but life is dark because I am so deeply hidden under God's wing. My heart cries out, why, O oh God, will you not answer my prayer? But when this happens, God in His time and His various graceful ways comes to remind me that I am not alone. He has given His best to me, and I am His own beloved child. Will He withhold anything good from me? Never. Is Jesus enough to make up this aching void in my soul? I do not always feel that it is so, she writes, but it is. Jesus loves me, this I know. Elisha is a man of limited knowledge. He doesn't understand why exactly this tragedy has come upon her, but the Lord knows. And the Lord has a good purpose in it. We need to believe that. We need to believe that when trials come, when tragedy strikes. And as the widow clings to him saying, I will not leave you, the Spirit is, is teaching us to do the same thing, to look to the Lord and say, I will not leave you. I'll not let go of you. Elisha, we see in the second place, is not only a man of limited knowledge, he's also a man of limited power. In verses 29 to 31, his initial idea of of laying his staff on the boy's head doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so Elisha himself has only one recourse, and that's to turn to the Lord himself in prayer. And that's exactly what he does. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. And so he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And and what follows in verses 34 and 35, you could say, is is an expression or an extension of his prayer. Then he went up and, and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And and what Elisha is doing here as he as he does this, he puts mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand, as Elisha is, is identifying with this child. He's identifying with him, just as the Lord Jesus is ultimately going to identify with us. And as Elisha stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child 
became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her and she came to him and said, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. The Lord restored the boy to life. And this restoration we must see as a sign. This restoration of life is a pledge, we know, of, of greater things that are to come. It's a glorious preview of the, of the victory that God will one day bring in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in light of that glorious resurrection of Christ that that our faith is likewise reassured as the Shunammites was so long ago. Luke records a similar account in Luke chapter 7 with the, the mother in Nain, the same area as Shunamm on the other side of the mountain. And he sees the, the procession carrying the, the boy to the graveside. And, and what does he do? He restores his life. And, and to those Israelite seers, they must have seen a, a recapitulation of something they had read long ago. Now the, the greater one has come. He didn't have to go to the boy. He simply spoke, and it was so. We see it again with Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. He spoke, and it was so. In light of the fact that Christ's resurrection has conquered death, even as we grieve, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because we know the one who has said, even though you die, yet shall you live, for I myself am the resurrection and the life. Not only do we know him, but more importantly, more significantly, he knows us. And his glorious resurrection is a guarantee that we too shall also be raised with him on the last day. We confess that in Lord's Day 19, in Lord's Day 17, rather. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, but those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That's our confidence. Darrell Davis tells the story of a 19th century pastor whose wife died after giving birth to their second child, and the pastor took his friend to, to look at his wife's dead body one last time before lowering her down to the ground. And, and as they peered over her motionless form without uttering anything else, the pastor repeated the words of the Westminster Catechism, the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. As we confess in Lord's Day 22 of our own catechism, not only will my soul be taken immediately to Christ, its head, but also my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made just like Christ's glorious body. And this congregation is the promissory note that our passage ends on. Our passage ends on this note of the hope of the resurrection, the reality that, that not even death can put you beyond the reach of Christ's saving power. Even as our faith is, is tested by tragedy and trial, and it is, it is. Our faith is reassured by the guarantee of the resurrection. All those trials and tests and tribulations serve to, to exercise that living hope, as Peter describes, that faith on tiptoes that peers over the test, over the trial, to that day of our Lord's appearing. As Revelation 14 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may now rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Amen. Let us pray. 
gracious God and Heavenly Father, even though it is at times difficult for us to confess, we do confess that you're the God who brings us to seasons of gladness, and you're the God who also brings us through seasons of sadness. Lord, we struggle with that at times in this world. We have questions like, why? Why is this happening? Why is it happening now? Why to me? Lord, your ways are not always understandable to us. But you have proven yourself to be a God whose ways are always good. Lord, help us to believe that when we find ourselves in the midst of the test, in the midst of the trial. When darkness seems to be our only friend, may we know that life is dark, not because you're against us, but because we are so deeply hidden under the shadow of your wing. Lord, we pray that in the midst of our grief and sorrow as we lament the tragedies of this life, that you would bid us to look upward, to look heavenward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who already now is raised from the dead, and more than that, who is coming again. May our eyes be always fixed upon him until he comes. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.